In this video, I'm going to have a look at how you can reverse the contents of a Python list while at the same time emphasizing the object orientated nature of Python. In particular, the fact that a list is an instance of the list class and as a consequence, the instance will have access to attributes that are defined in the class. And one of the attributes we will see will be the method reverse. Why would you want to reverse a list? Well, let's take a situation whereby you want to look at the list of pupils in a class and you have an alphabetical order of names and you build a graphical user interface and the list holds the names and the names are transferred to the graphical user interface for you to view. However, you want to view somebody with the name of Zimmerman. Now, obviously, they're going to be at the end of the list because their surname begins with Z. So what you can do, you can reverse alphabetically order the names. And this is an example of why you might want to reverse a list. Let's consider this example. And if you look here, you can see that this is my YouTube channel and here we can see we have a video that was uploaded one day ago. Here's a video that was uploaded two weeks ago. Here's one that was three weeks ago and so on. And if you come over here, you can see that these have been sorted by the date added. And in brackets, you can see that it says newest. So what I have here is a list of all of the videos that I've uploaded and starting with the newest. Now, of course, it may be the case that I want to look at what the first video was that I uploaded, in which case I can click onto here and the order of the videos appearing, as you can see them here, is reversed. Consequently, this will then become the last video to be listed. And this one would be the second last video to be listed. And in in this position, you would have the first video that I ever uploaded to YouTube listed. In this position would be the second video that I ever uploaded to YouTube. So you can see there is a need to reverse things as can be seen here. Let's consider this program statement and you can see I've chosen this name my underscore list which has been assigned this slot and we can see that this is a list because I've used these square brackets here and if we have a look at the elements of the list you can see we have a 1 which is an example of an integer. We have 3.142, which is the approximate value of pi and is an example of a float. Here you can see I've got a string and that's the name of one of my websites. Here I've just randomly chosen the number 400, which is another example of an integer. Here I've got 9.81, which is an example of a float. And that number is the acceleration due to gravity and its units are meters per second squared. And here you can see I've got the name of one of my other websites. Now I've just chosen these values really at random because I wanted to show that a list can contain values of different types. Now if we consider what happens when we execute this line of code, we're going to get a list created and this list is going to have six elements because there are six values here. And if we have a look at the list, you can see it goes from zero index all the way up to five, making six in total. And here you can see that all of it is known by the name my underscore list. Now, what I would like to stress at this point is my underscore list is a name that is bound to the instance where this list is an instance of the list class and it will be populated by everything that was shown within the brackets here. And you can see that the list now contains the one, the value of pi, the name of the website, 400, 9.81 and the other name. So these values you can see appear here. Now this is an instance of the list class. These, well these are values. Now this is an instance of the integer class and this is an instance of the float class. This is an instance of the string class. And in reality, what will be stored in here are the references to the integer of one, a reference to this float, a reference to this string. But from the purpose of looking at lists, I think you need to have a visual representation as shown here and just realize that these values are stored in the list and you can see that they are all different types. But the whole thing is an instance of the list class and these values will be instances of other classes and they're stored within this instance of the list class.
Now let's consider this program statement and you can see it uses the name that is bound to the instance of the list class, namely this object here. And then you can see we have dot notation. Following the dot, we have the word reverse with brackets. Now this is a message, and it's a message that's going to invoke this method. And this method would have been declared, defined in the class list. And this, the instance of that class, so what we have here is a message to this object. And I like to show the message as shown here. And within the arrow, you can see it has the word reverse. And what this will do, it'll reverse these values within the list. And the code responsible for that will have been defined in the list class. So what you will see happening is the following everything is put in the appropriate place as dictated by the reverse method. So you can see here we have one in the last position and that a moment ago before we sent the message was in the first position. This is in the second to last position and it was in the second position before the reverse method was invoked. Here, well this was in the last position but it is now in the first position. And if you look carefully at the values you can see that they are reversed from what was created on this line here. Now, why the emphasis on class and objects? Well, the reason being, if you have a look at this program statement here, it is a message, and a message belongs to the object-orientated paradigm. And what we're doing with this message is we're sending to this instance of the list class something that will invoke this reverse method which is declared in the list class and of course if we're going to have messages we know we need this dot notation now i'd like you to reflect back on the previous couple of videos in the playlist on python lists and you will remember that we had the max and the min functions not methods those functions were not declared in the list class. They're examples of built-in functions and they're built-in because they don't just act upon instances of lists, they will also act upon strings and other data structures in Python. But here, when you see this, you have to realize that we're dealing with instances of classes. And what this is doing, it's invoking one of the methods that appear in the declarations section of that class. Now, we are not responsible for creating the list class. That's done by the Python developers. But what we do know as a programmer is that this method can be invoked. How it works, we don't know, and frankly, we shouldn't care. The thing is, what we know is what it will do. Now, of course, when we write our own classes, we will have to care how things are done because we're going to be responsible for writing the code. But these things are given to us by the developers of Python and the people who develop the list class. And reverse is an example of a method within the definition of the list class. And again, I'll repeat, you have to send a message to invoke it, hence the need for this dot notation. Let's now consider this simple program that shows how we can reverse the elements of a list. And here we can see the runtime. Let's refer to here, and you can see that we just have a comment, how to reverse the elements in the list. And this line, well, that's going to create the list. And we've seen this on the previous slides in this video. This then prints out a user-friendly string, which you can see here. This line, well, you can see it prints out my list. And there you can see the list, and there you can see the 1, the 3.142, and so on. And you can see that these elements are as reflected here when we created the instance of the list. We then execute this line, which is responsible for this space. And then you can see we have the message on this line. Now this message is to this instance and this message which uses the dot notation will invoke this method that's part of this object and it's part of the object because this is an instance of the list class where this was defined. So now the list will have been reversed. 
When we come onto this line, it will print out this user-friendly string, as you can see here. Now we print my list, and of course you can see that is here. And if you look very carefully at the elements, you can see they have been reversed. For example, this is the one in the last position, and that was in the first position up here. And this johnphilipjones.com is in the first position, and if we look here, you can see it was in the last position. So it's a very straightforward program to show us how we can reverse the list. Now, while I'm here discussing this reverse, let's have a look at the list when it was created and the list after we've invoked the reverse method on that list. And you can see that the elements are now storing different values. Now, this tells us that a list can be altered. It is regarded as being mutable. You can change the values stored in the elements of the list. Check out the supporting website for these videos. In addition, why not follow me on Twitter as I issue a tweet every time I upload a new video.